evening and welcome inside Stuff Burger Bar for this week's edition of the Ernest Collins Jr. Show. Troy Coverdale joined by the head coach of the Bears who moved to 3-1 and one this past Saturday afternoon by holding off Northern Arizona in a 21-18 contest. The Bears win their Big Sky opener and now head on the road to face number four Eastern Washington this coming Saturday afternoon. Let's start with the fact that your defense <laughs> was the one to finally be able to pull this one out for you on Saturday afternoon. We've talked so much about how your defense was uh, in a position where they were having to learn very quickly on the defensive backfield specifically, and on Saturday, they were the heroes for you. Yeah, it, it was awesome to see our guys come out and, and, and just, um, you know, play defense the way we want to play. I mean, they, they dang near played the plan to perfection outside of, you know, letting them get in the red zone too many times. But we were determined not to let their two star receivers take over the game. And, you know, like I said on Saturday, to hold those two guys under 100 yards and then to have one of our young DBs get defensive player of the week in the conference. Um, just added bonus to it. You really threw a curveball at them, at least in terms of what we are used to seeing from your defense, and that was for the most of the ball game, you played a three-man front and left eight guys in coverage, utilizing your linebackers and defensive backs to do the work against that receiving core. Yeah, I mean, we, we know they're a throwing team. They want to get the ball down the field, and so we were willing to, you know, give up a couple yards in the run game and, and uh, you know, and – to Kyle Newsom credit and Brian Stansberry and our linebacking core, they did a great job of, you know, playing a short box and getting some tackles made um, to save some gains for us, you know, in that in, in, the, in the run game. But, um, yeah, we were determined that we're going to make them – if they were going to beat us, they, were gonna, they weren't going to beat us throwing the ball. Talk about Marshawn Cameron because this is a kid, as you mentioned, gets the conference defensive player of the week on her 13 tackles, the two fumble recoveries, one of them a forced fumble on his part as well. That is one of the guys that you said had to learn very quickly in that defensive backfield. Yeah, talented kid, man. He is really a talented kid. Um, he has ball skills. He, he might have a set of uh, a pair of best hands on the football team you know um he, he can hang with any of those receivers with it with his ball skills and he can jump out the gym you know so um just looking forward to seeing him grow and uh you know once ellis is done back to returning punts marshawn will slide right in there right behind him because he, he's a very talented guy when it comes to the return game as well so um, it was awesome to see um, those guys grow up before your eyes on Saturday that was uh, something that of course has been talked about and talked about and talked about when it was over how big were the smiles on their faces that they had pulled that one off? You know, it was just – it was good to see those guys have some success. Um, you know, Coach, George, Coach Gordon gave uh, Michael Walker some confidence as well because, mm -hmm. you know, Mike started playing uh, number eight pretty, pretty well and he's a bigger body. So, Coach just started sending him. He just started following him when he could. And that gave Mike some confidence that Coach had that much confidence in him. So, um, like I said, it was good to see those guys, you know, like, like I said, grow up before your eyes with Thomas back there leading it. You know, we put Thomas in the middle last week, so he was able to orchestrate a lot of things. And so it was just good to see those guys play well. And, and that's an important aspect of it because Thomas is the veteran. He's the guy who has seen it all before and can really help guide the younger guys to what needs to be accomplished. Yeah, I mean, he, he's the it's, – it's, it's strange to say, you know, that he's the senior leader back there um, because it seemed like we just got him a few days ago, but – um, Thomas is a great kid, man, and he's, he's a team captain on defense, him and Stansberry, and they, good, they do a good job of running that over there. Turning it to the offensive side of the ball, a very solid offensive performance in the first half, and then the second half came about and the offense struggled. Uh, did not uh, get things going yet again after halftime, after having performed well. I, it, and this is, again, why we talk about the defense having turned the trick for you this week because they had to hold off northern arizona in the second half because the offense was not being able to gain anything yeah and i think it was one of those deals man and and this is the 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 growth process and the continued growth of, of slaughter in the sense of you know i think he was playing kind of apprehensive in that second half because he didn't want to get the ball turned over or, or anything like that and so he's kind of playing cautious and that's what we got to you know get him to understand man you do what you do don't play cautious just play football um but I think it was one of those deals where if, if we can just hold on and don't turn the ball over, our defense is playing well enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we caused a couple turnovers in that game. And I think that was kind of what it was. So we just got to get him to understand, hey, man, just play your game. Play your game. It's funny that it would be more of a pressure situation on him 
in that case than, say, the Abilene Christian mm -hmm. game where he was put in and really could just cut loose because you needed the offense that night. Right, and that's what we need Kyle to do, period. Just, just cut loose and play football. Um, don't worry. Like I told him today out on the field, man, if – you know, if, if you got an interception and you got three touchdowns and 300 yards, who cares about the interception? This is play ball, you know. And so um, that's what we got to do is getting him cutting it loose, letting it go, and not worrying about what mistake he may make and things like that because we talked about it, you know, making a mistake in the first um, quarter of the CSU game. And it kind of, you know, set him back a little bit. And now we have to get him out of that mode. Okay, well, I can't make a mistake because I don't want to set the team back. And don't worry about it. That's why it's a team. You got offense and a defense. And, and uh, you know, Coach Boyer was pretty upset, you know, with the performance of the offense. And like I told him, all you need to do is score 19 points a day and we win the game, you know. One of the things that was striking about it was, and I noted it during the broadcast, it was very different from what you had done to this point this season in terms of being able to keep your offense on the field. Third down conversions were a, a great number for you, 51% through mm -hmm. three games. And the other afternoon, you only convert on three third downs. Yeah, I mean, it, like I said, it was one of those deals where – and I, I told our guys this. I told our guys this on Sunday. I said, man, I, I had all the confidence in the world that if, if it would have been different, if we wouldn't have got the two turnovers in the red zone and they would have scored three or scored seven points, I believe our offense would have got it done and, and put some more points up on the board. But when we kept holding them out, holding them out, holding them out, it changes the mindset of everybody. It changes the mindset of the coordinator. It changes the mindset of the players. Okay, we just – they're playing, they're making turnovers. We just can't screw this up right now, <laughs> you know. And so um, it, it was, like I said, I had every confidence. I wasn't really nervous in that game because you just, it was kind of the flow of the game, mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, we made some huge, huge stops, um, you know, down there in the red zone. And, and sometimes you got to do that. One of the things that's striking about it is that in the last two meetings in Greeley now, Northern Arizona has turned it over five times to you. Or, I'm sorry, eight times to you. Five, two years ago, then you turn around and get three the other day, two of them in the red zone. Uh, they're not going to want to come back to Greeley. We'll take it how we can get it. <laughs> <laughs> UNC with the victory on Saturday afternoon, again by the final of 21-18. to 18. It puts the Bears at 3-1 and one for the first time since 2003 and 1-0 and oh in Big Sky Conference action, one of four teams that are out to an unbeaten start through the first two weeks of the conference campaign. UNC travels this week to Eastern Washington to battle the fourth-rated team in the country. We've got much more coming up on the Ernest Collins Jr. Show. We're live at Stuffed Burger Bar just off the the 9th Street Plaza in downtown Greeley on 1310 KFKA. Do you choose the path that is well-traveled? Or do you choose a landscape that opens up a whole new world of choices, experiences, and opportunities? A journey where you discover, laugh, reach, grow, celebrate. A landscape without limits, a shared journey, an adventure for life. This is the University of Northern Colorado. Football fans, time to return to your blue and gold roots. Northern Colorado football is set to host Sacramento State on Saturday, October 22nd at 1 p.m. as we celebrate homecoming in Greeley. Join us for Fan Fest beginning at 9 a.m. for some of the best tailgating around. The first 1,500 fans through the door will receive stocking caps from Bank of Colorado, and one lucky fan will get the chance to win an Evo 50 scooter valued at over $1,000. Tickets are going fast, so call 970-351-4849 or visit uncbears.com and reserve your tickets today. After having just the one home game in the month of September, the Bears with two in the month of October, but we've got two weeks before that will take place when the Bears take on Sacramento State coming up on the 22nd. We'll talk much more about that in the days ahead, but this week UNC is a homecoming team on the road. 
The Bears go to number four Eastern Washington this Saturday afternoon for what will be a 2.05 Mountain Time kickoff, 105 coverage on 13.10 KFKA. Much more uh, to preview with the Eagles coming up, but let's talk about where your team sits now coming off of that victory because uh, it, it was one where you've got the team that was picked to win the big sky in the preseason by coaches and the media together. You gain the win at home. You sit at 1-0 and while they're trying to find some answers right now. What's your assessment on what your team has accomplished? You know, really for us, man, we're, we're in a stage where we're just trying to get better every week. You know, and I know it's an old coach's cliche, but it's literally what it is for us. You know, it's just about, you know, taking it one practice at a time and one week at a time and, and not worrying about all the rest of it. You know, we know, um, you know, we got a tough battle every week when it comes to Big Sky football. So um, we came out this morning, um, had a really good day of practice and, uh, you know, getting the guys locked in and focused in to understand the next tall task that we have coming up this weekend. Is it easier coming off of a game to get them back into practice than it is at that week, uh, that uh, af that day of practice after a bye week, excuse me? You know what? Sometimes it is. Yeah. You know, when you, you just came off a game, especially when you're coming off a game and you got a victory under your belt and, and they're fired up and they're ready to see what's next, you know. And so, yeah, because this Tuesday was a lot better than last Tuesday. Right. Last Tuesday I had to do some attitude adjustments. Um, and we, we got it together. Um, and this week we came out and, and, you know, had a pretty decent day. Um, so, yeah, I would say it, it's, it's better. But anyhow, it's, it's always better coming off a W. Hint, attitude adjustment <laughs> means conditioning <laughs> for folks who don't know. Uh, that said, you also want to set a tone, though, that you want each practice to be at that level. You want that consistency in practice, time in, time out, as opposed to riding a bit of a roller coaster. Yeah, my old strength coach, Dinky Williams, used to say, you're either getting better or getting worse, you're never staying the same. You know, and so you try to get that intensity level in practice up every day. You know, and, and, and I talked to him today afterwards. It's like, man, you are very blessed to get to do what you do. You know, you, 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 you're, you're in a very small, minute percentage of people that can say they play college football. You know, and so you got to cherish that. You have to. Um, want to be a part of that, and you have to welcome that every time you get up and you get a chance to come out here and, and play this great game. So I know there are seven guys that would love to be in your shoes right now playing that can't play for the rest of the season. So I'm um, just trying to get them to understand what a, what a gift and a blessing it is for them. How tough is it for those guys to be on the sideline and having to watch practices as well as games? It, it's tough. I mean, you know, for the young ones that got hurt and know they have a, a year or two or three left, it, you know, I, 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 this is what I try to get them to do, man. Because I always said if I could have been a coach first and go back and play the game, it would have been so much easier to play the game after seeing it from a coach's perspective. Um, you know, so that's how I try to get them guys to do, just fall into the coach's line this year since you can't play anymore. You know, when you get someone like Brandon Lenore, we don't know whether he's going to get a year back or not. It's kind of hard because you don't know whether you're going to get back on the field or not. Again, you don't know if your college career is over. So it's a little more uh, painful, if you will, for that young man until he knows what his future is going to be. And that's the disappointing aspect of it is that a lot of times it, it is the waiting game mm -hmm. because you're stuck having to wait not just for what's going on through the remainder of this year. Mm -hmm. Rehab is never easy. And not only are you not playing – in the case of some guys, they are having to wait on factors that are well beyond their control in right. the case of the NCAA. Right, and he's handling it great, man. He's handling it great. He's, he's out there, and, he's, he, you know, he's there for the young guys. But, you know, I, I think our defense would have looked a lot different if we mm -hmm. had Brandon Lenore and Thomas Singleton out there playing, you know, leading those young guys uh, at the corner spot. But, you know, it, it's kind of one of those deals. It's, it's life lessons. You know, mm -hmm. we, we talk about it all the time. Football is the greatest lesson of life because – you just never know the circumstances. And you, all, you have to depend on someone to do what you have to do. And, and, and so for him, it's, it's, it's not going to be uh, all for not. He's going to learn something from this, and he's going to be able to help someone later on down the line. Uh, the key part of that uh, is rehab that mm -hmm. we talk about. And this is an area where we have been so very blessed. And, in fact, just even this past weekend with the Hall of Fame banquet honoring Steve Antonopoulos, the, the Broncos trainer, who gained both of his degrees at UNC mm -hmm. and spent time in the athletic training program at UNC before moving on to the Broncos. The, the training program is so stellar at what it does in helping your guys. No question. I mean, you know, just talking about Greek with the Broncos and then, 
you know, we've had a, a couple guys with us, and now we have June, and he's doing an awesome job, you know, and, and uh, he's out there. The guys love him, and, and he's up with the reports. We give him a hard time when the list starts to get too long. You know, he needs to get some guys off the list. but That's coaching right there. That's, that's <laughs> right. All, all it is is coaching. <laughs> he's working his butt off and his staff, you know, from – um, from Brady to his student helper. I mean, all those those folks do an awesome job with our guys. And it's hands-on for the students, and that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what better program, I think, to, to be learning in, in at UNC because of the opportunities that are there and the people that you're working with. Yeah, I mean, I came through that, that program, that SES program. Um, now they call it SES, more mm -hmm. fancy name. Um, but our students do an awesome job in the sense that some of our players prefer. There are certain students they won't get taped by anybody else. They'll go to that student to get taped because mm -hmm. they do such a good job. So um, it is one of the top-notch um, athletic training programs in the country. And it, they're tasked with an awfully tall task, and that is, yes, trying to keep that list from growing too long yeah. week in and week out because uh, football really does begin to wear on you, especially when you're in the midst of what is an 11-week, 12-week season. Right. You know, and – the advantage we have, too, you got better health right here in town. You know, sure. and so we have all the docs, um, you know, at our disposal, and we can get our kids in and see them. Docs come over to the building facilities, and they're doing it all, you know, for the most part. It's just their time. They're willing to give their time for UNC Athletics, and um, that's a great partnership that we have. That is, no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, I'll tip my cap to the guys at Banner and NCMC as well for other reasons that we won't get into tonight, <laughs> but y you can understand. Uh, when that list gets too long, though, it's frustrating from a coaching standpoint because you are left having to really work around uh, what you don't have. You've mentioned already seven players this season that have suffered season-ending injuries. Well, unfortunately, that's football. That, that is what we go through in the game of football, and it can vary so much from year to year. Knock on wood, thus far this year, injuries have not been a major part, though, of what you have to deal with on a week-to-week -week basis. Yeah, I mean – it, that's where recruiting comes in. You know, the, the the better you go out and the better kids you get to come in, and now you have depth at certain positions and, and competition at positions. Now it's plug and play, you know, so to speak. And so, and not that you, you know, if your guys are in it, you just push them off to the side and put the next one in. Um, that's what you're doing on game day. But those guys are as much as part of what we're doing um, during the week as anybody else. That's a great point because we always talk about next man up. Mm-hmm. And you don't want it to be next man up turning that cold shoulder on the guy who just fell. Right. No question. And, and that's a perfect example of that, you know, um, you know, Nip got voted one of our team captains. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of one of those deals. He, he's still our team captain. He's going to go on every trip because he's a leader on our football team, you know. And so he still walked up to me, you know, ready to go out for the coin toss you right. know, before the game and giving the instructions. And he goes out and he's doing it, of course. Being a competitor that he is, it, it's painful for him to go out there and not be playing. And I'm pretty sure he's, oh, we should have, we could have did this, we could have did, you know, right. those types of things because of who he is. Um, but he's handling, and the guys are going to look at, the guys are looking at him. They're looking at how he's handling this situation. And, in fact, we noted it the other day that he went out for the coin toss because a lot of times you don't see an ass student athlete that is not in uniform mm -hmm. out there for the coin toss. It's an unusual thing, but you're right. He is one of your captains. Yeah, he was chomping at the bit, you know, um, <laughs> to, to be on the field, to want to stay on the sideline and, and uh, you know, just trying to convince him, hey, we got to get the shoulder healed up a little more before we put you in that, that zone down there that may cause you to fall or something like that and injure it even more. So, you know, it, it's the competitive spirit in him, but he's – He's putting that hat on. He was out at practice today, putting that hat on. He's been out there all week, you know, um, last week as well, just being that coach on the football field. Again, the Bears this week headed for Eastern Washington, and they do so relatively healthy coming off of the last uh, week of football, but the uh, bye week before that w was a real boon for you, especially some of the nagging injuries such as Mikhail DuBose's ankle injury going into the NAU contest. Yeah, I mean, it, it, so it, it, the bye week came at a great time for us. You know, coming off the FCS, FBS game and, and, you know, you got a time to heal up and get the guys, you know, get them some time off, you know, and, and uh, get them back healthy and let them take a break. You know, we, we practiced on Tuesdays and Wednesdays um, uh, and then during that bye week. And it was pretty good just to give them those essentially those three days off with some conditioning in there a couple of days and then get back to work on Sunday. So it did. It gave us a chance to heal up. And, and uh, we came out of this one uh, fairly well. You always got some nicks and bruises. but Damn. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that's, that's about all you can ask, isn't it? No question. As you get ready for this matchup this week, you look at 1-0. and How good does that feel? It's awesome. Um, you know, anytime. You can win a game, and, and, you know, it's our first time being 1-0 in conference, starting out, you know, it's the first time since, I think you said, 2003, you know, being 3-1. And, one and, and uh, it's, it's, like I tell our kids, that ought to make you even more hungry, you know, because you've tasted it. You understand what it tastes like, and now you, you want more and you want more. And so that's what I'm looking at our kids every day, just pushing them as far as I can push them to get them to understand we got to compete every day if we want to continue to win ball games. Again this weekend, number four, Eastern Washington, the opponent, as the Bears and the Eagles will battle at the Inferno. <laughs> Roos Field in uh, Cheney, Washington. We'll talk about the matchup. Yes, that red field as well when we continue with more of the Ernest Collins Jr. Show. We're live at Stuck Burger Bar in downtown Greeley on 1310 KFKA. UNC Bears fans, volleyball is back at Bank of Colorado Arena on Thursday, October 6th and Saturday, October 8th. Thursday night's first serve is slated for seven as the Bears take on Big Sky Conference foe, Portland State. Make sure to join us again on Saturday at 7 when the Bears face another Big Sky rival, Sacramento State. Saturday night is also season ticket holder appreciation night, so get there early and join in on the fun. For tickets or more information, call 970-351-4849 or log on to uncbears.com. Moving into the second half of this week's Ernest Collins Jr. Show, live from Stuffed Burger Bar in downtown Greeley here on 1310 KFKA. UNC now 3-1, and 1-0 one, one and in Big Sky Conference action after the home win over Northern Arizona last weekend. Back-to-back -back weekends on the road now facing the Bears with the matchup this Saturday at Eastern Washington, followed by road trip back to the West Coast. This time it would be the North Bay area as they will travel to UC Davis. Back-to-back -back road games. Schedule's not being very kind to you in terms of uh, the road thus far. You've only had the two home games thus far, but uh, you've got to take them as they come, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I can't control it. I try not to worry about things I can't control, so that's where the schedule laid out. We got two in a row. We'll go play it and come back home and get the next one. When you are working on a schedule for each year, and next year's a, a prime example in that you'll have CU and Florida back-to-back -back on the road, how much say do you have in trying to align home games as much as possible? Well, I mean, you know, obviously the conference schedule is set. So sure. all we have control over is our non-conference games. And some years you have three, some you have four. And so, um, yeah, our, our administration does a good job of coming to me and asking me, you know, kind of what I think, how I want to do it. You know, David and I are working really close um, right now on schedule for 18, 19, 20, you know, type of deal. So, um, sometimes you get in years like we have um, this next year. You just got to deal with it and, 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 you know, make it work. If you had your druthers, it would be – those two would be spread out a little more, I'm sure. Well, if I had my druthers, I wouldn't play neither <laughs> one of them. <laughs> but, uh, you, know, it, it's, you know, it's – Spoken a, it's, like a coach. Right. It's necessary um, that you got to do it sometimes. But, I mean, it's, it's what we're talking about when, when you talk about injuries. You know, we have 63. Um, they got 85. Mm -hmm. You know, so – it's there's a difference there and that's where the the you know it's it's not about the starters per se but it's about all those positions after that right that that you lose you know when you get into the third and the fourth quarters and things like that obviously we didn't show that against CSU but that's usually what it is you know and so it's just the depth that you have or you don't have in fact I was in the discussion and you and I have talked about this before but I was in the discussion with someone who was talking about the Bill McCartney era at CU mm -hmm. and how so much of it was because they were able to recruit to CU. And I pointed out that part of that also, though, was because the big guns were no longer able to hoard players the right. way that they were at the time. A lot of guys that would have been a three or a four at a Nebraska or a five right. or on down the line had other options because the scholarships weren't going as deep as they were at those schools. Right, that, that's why you start to see, you know, your Trey Reeks and your Alex Wesleys and all those guys like that that trickle down to us because they're only allowed to take 25 a year at an FBS level. We're allowed to take 30. And so, you know, you're looking at your Cooper Cups and your Emmanuel, uh, your Elijah's Parks and all those guys that are 
these players that you're like, geez, how did he end up at that school? Sure. Well, you know, it just – you only can take so many years. So that it, it trickles down to us. And that's where I think it, it was a great deal because you're starting to see some great football players, players from lower levels. Plus – you get someone like a Carson Wentz who goes as a number one pick in the uh, NFL draft, number one to a team that is, number two overall pick at quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. And the more that he acquits himself in that role, the more it draws attention to what FCS football is. No question. It's the same thing with our own, you know, our own Vincent Jackson. You know, we, we just we're, he plays Division two football for most of his career. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's the second round draft pick, you know, but it just goes to show that they can't get them all. You just have to go out there and beat the trees, beat the bushes, turn over rocks, and find those players that you deem to have um, the potential to be great for you. And that's really what it is. It's, it's not about the coaching. It's about the kids you're able to recruit because they make it happen. It, it also allows for you, though, to be able to build that program a little differently than what it would have been 25 years ago. Yeah, no question. I mean, when you, when you got – you know, the, the, the thing for us, um, you know, in the recruiting side of it um, is that we've gotten more and more resources every year. Right. University's giving us more and more every year. And then, like you said, the FBS programs can't hoard them and throw player A, B, and C on the track scholarship, so to speak, <laughs> and, you know, and then get them back later. So the kids are sitting out there and they want to go play. They don't, And most of them don't want to. Kids nowadays, they don't want to just go put a jersey on their back and say, I am a player at school at Notre Dame, at Nebraska, they want to go play football, you know, and so it, it, it's great for us to be able to go out and find those guys and convince them that you can come here and play right away. And I've made it clear that really there are about three things that have set the tone for where we are in college football right now. Uh, the first was the SMU death penalty <laughs> because it changed the future of the Southeastern Conference, thus the Big 12, and away we went. The 1984 Supreme Court decision that was Oklahoma and Georgia involved, they wanted the rights to be able to market their own football games rather than the NCAA setting who the opponents were. And you had this behemoth that would become ESPN mm -hmm. that played a role in that. And then scholarship changes. Right. And the amount of scholarships that teams were allowed to have, schools were allowed to have, and the number of guys that they could bring in. All of those things have really turned college football into what it is where we look at more of the upsets each week and we look at a little more parity than what there used to be and that does trickle down to this level it does I mean like I said that's how you end up with some great players at this level and you're, you're starting to see some great football games at this level and you're starting to get FCS teams that are beating FBS teams right you know because like I said if you can stay healthy throughout that game and you have built your team up and you know that your guys are ready to go you can upset somebody on any given on any given Saturday so uh, that's what we're trying to get our program to is where we, our kids have the confidence, we have the players, um, the size, the speed, the strength, that you can go compete with anybody. Have you found that it was maybe tougher to build this program to where it is even today than what you expected? Um, yeah, I was, I mean, obviously I expected to have it much faster. Um, but I don't think anybody, and, and that's why I, I give so much of credit you know, to our administration. I don't think you should ever – bring a coach into a program that has been down as long as we were down and not give them five, six years sure. to get the program turned around. That, that's why you, you find programs that they never get off the snide. It's like over and over because they two years fire, three years you fire. You don't get a chance to get all your guys and you don't get a chance to change the mindset of people and players to understand what you want. An Urban Meyer stepping in and making things happen immediately is more the unusual aspect as opposed to what the norm is. But Unfortunately, people expect those automatic improvements when coaches take jobs. Yeah, I mean, Urban's a great football coach. I don't. But you got to understand yeah. those situations that he stepped in from, whether it be Utah, you know, to Florida. I mean, in Ohio State, he wasn't stepping into programs that were, like, down for right. 10 years. Right, and, You know, he's stepping into them programs where all he has to do is come in and get some motivation going. Those guys are going to play for you. But, unfortunately, fans a lot of times in their expectations yep. expect you to catch lightning in a bottle and make that no question. immediate change and overhaul everything and have it work immediately and to the positive, and it doesn't. It yeah. doesn't always go that way. A lot of times you still have to build something. Yeah, I mean, you just take the example of the University of Kansas. Um, Mark Mangino got there in 2002, and it took him – he was 2-12, and 12 and it just took him some time to get it going, but – he, he ended up, you know, Kansas 
hadn't really ever been that great of a football program. But you take Kansas to the Orange Bowl and you win the Orange Bowl. Right. And then it ain't been the same since, you know. But right. it, he had a formula, you know, along with some other things, but he had a formula that was working for him. And, you know, and so um, I know that they wish they could have got that under control before it got to what it was because they probably still be winning football games right now. The Bears, meanwhile, get ready to go against one team that has been very, very good, especially over the last decade and a half in the Big Sky Conference, Eastern Washington. The fourth-ranked team in the nation is the foe this coming Saturday afternoon at their place on a 2.05 Mountain Time kickoff. We'll preview the matchup when we continue with the Ernest Collins Jr. Coaches Show live from Stuffed Burger Bar in downtown Greeley on 1310 KFKA. Troy Coverdale back with Northern Colorado head football coach Ernest Collins Jr. as we move to our final segment on this week's edition of the Ernest Collins Jr. show from Stuffed Burger Bar. I tell you, look outside and it's darker now. It's getting getting to fall very, very quick. It is. It's, it's about to be. It's good for us to be practicing in the morning. So I, I was going to say, <laughs> when, when that first frost hit, hits, those guys aren't going to be real happy about that, I don't think. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how they handle that. But our guys, you know. Our guys are here now. They're used to the cold. They'll be okay. Morning practices were something that you have been wanting to do for a while. Why did it take so long to put into place? You know, just because of, of our academic schedule. You know, and, and uh, you know, Jimmy Cottrell and Jimmy Henderson have been working on it for a couple years now. Um, we've been able to do it in the spring, and I just think it's better for them academically. For one, I know they're up, so they shouldn't be missing class. For two, um, <laughs> I got them up in the morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, so I know they ain't doing too much partying the night before. True. You know, so it's all around. It's helping out for the academic piece. And we had some, some great GPAs um, in the last two springs. And so for me, I wanted to get it implemented in the fall so I can see if that will affect because we always drop off in the fall about a 2 6 two, seven. And in the spring, we're at that 2 8 five, two, nine. And so I want to get it up there all year round. And I think our guys are, are handling that pretty good now. This week, the matchup with Eastern Washington, of course, is the headline. Uh, the number four team in the country. And while we can sit here and talk until we're blue in the fa face about what Cooper Cup does for them, now the number one receiver all time in Division I history, their offense is dramatically different with Gage Gabrud at quarterback. Yes, he can run the football. <laughs> he's their leading rusher right now, mm -hmm. um, and he can throw it, and he's got more than just Cooper Cup to throw the ball to. You know, he's got four or five guys that he can, he can get the ball to, and so it, 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 it presents a challenge to you, you know. And so for us, we're just, we're just trying to, uh, you know, figure out a way to make him play left-handed, if you will. Um, and so, but we know, um, you know, we got our work cut out for us. You've seen him do it against Washington State. You've seen him. You know, they came up short against uh, NDSU, um, but everybody else, they've handled pretty well, you know. So um, we got our offense, we got to put some points on the board, and we got to figure out a way to slow this, this, uh, this offense down. And the reason why I went immediately to Gage and what he's doing in running the football is if you look back to the Abilene Christian game, that is an mm -hmm. area where Seeley hurt you the most right. was his rushing because it set up so many other things yep. that you maybe weren't ready to defend against. Yeah, and, and, and so it was good for us to see that or have that experience as well. And, you know, the, and the difficult thing about um, Gabe is his eyes are always downfield. He's not a uh, one, two, read, tuck it and run it. He's one, two, read. He's going to move the pocket and move his feet in the pocket. And he ain't running unless he has to. And when he has to run, then he's dangerous. A year ago, you had the opportunity and nearly pulled off the upset here at home. Is there anything that you can take from that game to utilize for this one? You know, it's just about understanding and knowing our kids understand that we can play with these guys. You know, it's not about they're so much, you know, above us that 
and we might not even go play the game. Our kids, are under, our, our kids are starting to have confidence in the big sky that we can go and play and compete with anybody. And so this year, as opposed to last year, it is we can, we're trying to stay off the roller coaster. You know, being up one week and down the next week, up one week, down the next week. And so just trying to be consistently getting better every week. And, and that's what we're trying to get our kids to understand. And it, and it starts in practice. It starts in the meetings on Sunday. And, you know, you got guys all over the place trying to get time to watch film. You know, and it's, it's interesting because they can get on their own computers and watch film at home through a program we got called Galaxy. But a lot of the guys like to be in the office watching film and they'll get in the office together and watch the film, and we have more guys now watching film than we've ever had in the past. How much of that is because guys want to be together and bounce things off each other, make sure that they're seeing it the same way as their teammates are? Well, yeah, that and our guys are closer. You know, we've been sure. preaching family, family, family since I got here because I think it's, it's harder for you to give up on any given Saturday or any given practice, if that matter, if you truly care about that guy that you're working with or you're having fun with. And so – um, a great example today, you know, we, we got out and we ran a little bit at the end of practice. And, you know, you had a couple guys that wasn't giving all they could give, and I didn't have to say a word. They were taking care of it. And as a coach, you just sit there and, and you get a smile on your face when you don't have to deal with it anymore. They, they handle it. And so that's a sign of a team starting to mature. Now we just got to take it and put it on the field every week. How much film do you think that those guys consume during a week? Oh, wow, I don't know, man. I mean – you get guys up there. I mean, we only get them for 20 hours a week, us as coaches. Sure. And so uh, that Monday's their day off, and they're all over the place on Monday up in, up in the office. And, you know, you got guys, I mean, you think it's their office. They got their feet propped up on the, uh, on the desk in the office watching while we're in the meeting room. And so, you know, I'd say they're probably putting in, you know, another 10, 15 hours a week just watching film, which is awesome. Which, which is great, and it also speaks to how the game has changed because okay. – Back in the day when it was VCR, there wasn't going to be multiple copies that could go out anywhere right. or right. just the old film. No way was it going anywhere but the office. Right, yeah. It, it, it's so different now. You don't have to worry about a tape or a, a physical thing. It's just cut the computer on and watch it, you know. And, and uh, like I said, they can watch it in their, any, on any device, on their telephones, on their laptops, whatever it is. They can pull it up and watch it now. And so and it, it's, it's helped recruiting out as well with the advent of, different programs like huddle and things like that you can pull up film instantly and watch a kid and so it's made a whole lot of things better we uh, got off track uh, talking about that in eastern washington defensively what do they challenge you with this week you know um their front four is pretty good you know they're going to come out they've been they've given up a, a, a couple of points this year um to some teams but their defensive front four is pretty good, and they got a couple guys in the secondary that can play really well. So, you know, we know that um, – I know that John's going to put a, a plan together, and, and now we just got to come out and execute it. And, and we may have, it may have to be one of them games where we're trying to match them, but we're coming up with a defensive scheme that hope we can minimize some of that as well. The only flaw with, uh, with all the guys watching film this week is – are you seeing an increase in headaches because of <laughs> trying to watch film from the red field? Yeah, that it is. It's, it's, it's a different. Uh, it's a different viewing. You know, watching just red, red, red. So um, the good thing is um, they've only had a couple home games, so it's not like all the games. You okay. know, watching on yeah. the red turf. So, um, but it, it's a different atmosphere. It's a different deal. Um, you know, it's you're trying to make your home field advantage. And, and uh, you know, I'm glad the conference stopped letting them wear the red uniforms on top of the red turf, you know. So um, that was too much of an advantage there. Someone asked me the other day, how is it different than Boise's blue? Well, that's easy. Blue is actually a more mellow yeah. color. That red is yeah. angry. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter how cloudy it is. Right. That red shows up. Yeah, but, you know, and, and we played on it a couple of times now. Once you start the game. It don't matter. You're just out there playing football, and, and you don't really notice again until the end of the game. So it, it's kind of one of those deals where you pop the film on Sunday and see it coming. But um, it's, it's their little uh, gimmick, their little deal that they have that they like to do, and, and more power to them. It'll be a good one. We uh, look forward to the trek, and uh, can't complain about Friday leave time. It'll be uh, a little bit of a cushion this time. Yeah, we don't have to get out there. We're going to a temperate time zone. It's our, to our advantage. So we ain't got to leave out of here until about 12 o'clock. Plus, we get home and sleep in our own beds when it's done. Yep, no question. Take that every time. <laughs> Ernest, thank you as always. You got it, my friend. Ernest Collins Jr. with us again as the Bears this weekend head for Eastern Washington. The fourth-ranked team in the FCS welcomes the Bears in for a 2.05 kickoff. Our coverage of it will begin at 1.05 this Saturday afternoon here on 1310 KFKA.